thinking that just because Max Verstappen didn't finish a race that Red Bull are going to fall apart? Well, I think the complete opposite will happen. Yeah, uh, Max is going to drive angry this weekend. Speaking of Red Bull, there is something I would like to share with you. Something that Checo said. And something that I got a lot of flack for not all that long ago. You know, the stuff about Checo not bothering to focus on Max and instead focusing on himself. Well, what does he go ahead and talk about? He talks about focusing on myself, particularly in regards to qualifying where he deems Verstappen as the only driver that can maximise the full potential of the car as of now. You see? What did I tell you? All that Checo needs to do is focus on his own race, do his own thing, maybe use Max Verstappen as a bit of a yardstick, and therefore he's going to have a much better time of it this season, where he's not being dragged through the dirt constantly by Helmut Marco, or beating himself up, or getting flack from the entire F1 community. This is exactly what Sergio Perez needs to do this year to try and maintain his place at Red Bull and maybe get himself that second contract extension with the Milton Keynes team after all. Yes, of course, if he can try and go for the world title, that'd be fantastic. But right now, he should really be focusing on Max Verstappen as some kind of barometer, since technically he is in the same car. And so that means if he can at least get a little bit close to Max Verstappen in terms of performance, then he will know as he has said in this particular article, that he would have been driving to the very best of his ability, and therefore he can be pleased with himself. And that's exactly the right mindset he needs considering what he went through last year. Most drivers will probably go that way. He has decided to somewhat go down the road that Gerhard Berger did when he was teammates with Ayrton Senna, when he realised how good Ayrton was, and that it would probably be best not to go after him trying to go for a world title and instead just be a teammate and do your own thing. I still stand by what I said in that video, and for your own consideration, I'll leave a link to it right here, so that means you can go look at it at your leisure. This frame of mind is really good, especially since Max Verstappen doesn't really consider Checo in any way as some kind of rival in 2024, or a driver to watch. With Checo not on Max's radar, this means that Sergio can basically do his own thing and then maybe spring a surprise or two later on in the year once he gets a handle of the car, and therefore it just means that his time of it this season, especially in a very critical season, with many other drivers trying to vie for a seat, this could be very valuable for him. Especially since Daniel and Yuki are bickering amongst themselves for that Red Bull seat, and now Liam Lawson is in the fray, and now Peter Bear, the CEO of Racing Bulls, is now going, yeah, yeah, Liam, yeah, Liam, stroke that fire, stroke that fire. What is going on at that team? It's absolutely crazy. But then again, Sergio's plans could count for nothing considering how good Carlos Sainz has been lately. It might mean that despite all of the stuff that Sergio is doing, doing better than Daniel and Yuki, Carlos might sweep in because, as we all remember, for 2020, going into 2021, Checo was a feel-good acquisition after them dropping Albon. They got Checo in, saved his career. Now they might be saving Carlos Sainz's career. And oh yeah, remember at the beginning of the season when they were talking about the Zero Pod concept that we would see the next evolution of it perhaps at the Japanese Grand Prix? Which is of course this weekend. I personally think that we're not going to see it because Ferrari have been a little bit more mm, potent than they probably expected. And Red Bull aren't that far ahead in the constructor, so taking these big risks right now might not be wise. And I also think this because Max Verstappen's comments are pretty coy, because when asked about it, he did say that the side pod colours are the same and that we shall see what happens. And I probably bet that we'll probably see some kind of a tweak, but probably more of a sedate pedestrian standard one. I like it when Max Verstappen's like this, when he's a bit coy, he's a bit playful, he's a bit sarcastic. Mind games are at their finest right now. Good news for all seven Alpine fans out there. They've actually gone and done it. They brought some upgrades much earlier than expected. And that's pretty good considering I made a video about it yesterday, considering that Gasly said there weren't any upgrades coming anytime soon, so they managed to deliver much quicker. And these upgrades aren't your typical small fry, like, you know, a little track specific tweak here or a beam wing here, since that seems to be all the rage now. Everyone comes with a beam wing. The beam wing is that little thing just right above the exhaust. It doesn't really look like much, but for some reason it's actually really, really important. But either way, beam wings here, beam wings there. But no, this is a brand new front wing, supposedly, as well as the, as the team principal Bruno Fami says, the first step of weight reduction. Now, considering that this is Suzuka, it's a very high downforce circuit, and it's also a place where you would like to have an agile car, which is not entirely bulky, this is a really good thing, which might mean that Alpine are less likely to be propping up the grid being 19th or 20th. So instead of both drivers falling out of Q1, we might get something better. Only one of them falls out of Q1. 
the chances of them scoring points are just that little bit better because as far as I've seen it, none of the other teams around them have brought upgrades. Well, I mean, quite frankly, any upgrades Salba bring will be pointless if they can't fix their pit stops, am I right? Well, it'll be better than the Saudi Arabian Grand Prix at least, and even better news, they'll be moving to, as they describe it, their predominantly blue livery. Now, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, but when we were promised the pink camo livery as a teaser, and then we didn't get that. We got a really lovely hypercar. And then we got the A524, which was predominantly carbon fiber. And then as part of the preseason testing on day three, we then got that little bit of an extra splodge on the nose cone to say, oh, we've added some blue, sacre blue. And it, no, that's not predominantly blue. It's just a little bit more blue. So yes, I know they're feeling blue right now, but predominantly, no. You are predominantly playing with us. But okay, at least they have brought some upgrades. And they brought it at a similar time frame when McLaren did. They brought them around the Azerbaijan Grand Prix, which was race four. And now we've got some upgrades, which might be a little bit relevant to the Japanese Grand Prix. So we might actually see Gasly and Ocon be able to do something instead of just languishing nearer the back and hoping for a safety car or some kind of chicanery, which results in some of the top five teams crashing out. And talking about upgrades, one team that really needs them right now is the likes of Mercedes. But this is a little bit of an update, more about what I said regarding a video I made last week and the comments that James Allison has made in terms of discovering what on earth is going on with the W15 and why on earth it's so utterly unpredictable. I actually would describe it as more of a cryptic sort of vehicle where it's good in some sessions and then not so good in others. They are starting to figure out a pattern where it's got something to do with temperature. And now Toto Wolf has elaborated on that by saying some comments that Lewis Hamilton had made had given him some pause for thought, where he would say, Lewis, that in FP3, in one session, the car was the best that it had been in about three years or so, and then in the next session, it was completely and utterly undrivable, which means that it probably has got something to do with the temperature window or cooling. And that's something that George Russell had elaborated on in Bahrain, where they got their cooling solution just that little bit wrong in terms of the louvres and cutouts. They probably sacrificed at least half a second a lap, which meant they probably weren't in contention for podiums when they might have been in the first race. Now that is something of interest, considering that the Japanese Grand Prix is looking likely to be quite a mild race. Not really hot, maybe not really cool, but somewhere in the region of the high teens, maybe 20 at most and also there is seemingly a chance of rain on Sunday afternoon about a 40% chance of that and maybe a little bit of rain in FP2. If we do get that and Mercedes are really competitive in the cooler sessions then I would not be surprised to see a Mercedes crack the top five because this might be where they are really good and if Lewis Hamilton is feeling really confident in the sessions where the car is with him where supposedly he had a good amount of rear downforce which is exactly what Lewis Hamilton likes then we might see him be the one Mercedes that cracks into the top five and maybe we might get a decent double points finish where they can finally just get that little bit more distance from Aston Martin cement themselves in P4 and maybe try to get back to McLaren in the quest for P3 but then that might be a little bit too late. That ship might have sailed, but they can at least do a little bit of damage limitation and make sure they don't fall behind the Silverstone team that is Aston Martin. But in any case, it does seem more than likely that Mercedes have managed to find out what on earth is that fundamental issue that has been plaguing them since the beginning of the season, which has made the Mercedes car just that little bit more confusing as to why this third concept in as many years hasn't proven to be the magic bullet that has gotten them back at the top of the grid again. By the way, Kimi Antonelli, he's actually getting a chance to drive a Mercedes soon at Imola in the W13, which is the 2022 car. And I think this is really interesting. He's now getting a chance to drive some relatively relevant machinery. And I bet you that we will see him in an FP1 session this season, around about the Italian Grand Prix, I reckon, since you know Kimi Antonelli is Italian and it's five days after his 18th birthday, which means he can drive a current Formula One car in an FP1 session. I bet it'll be Lewis who will be sitting out that particular session to compare Antonelli to Russell. And then we might get some clues as to who will be driving alongside George for 2025. I mean, if it were up to me, I wouldn't put Antonelli in the car just yet, even if he does have a blinder in F2 season. I mean, yay, I'm not Toto though. Now, speaking of, Ferrari's initial pace has been quite encouraging. And whilst the mixture of Max and the RB20 are still odds on to be the title favorites, the combination of the Ferrari drivers is a really potent one as well 
which might mean that we might see more of the Verlec results, similar to what we got between 2018 and 2021 when it was either Ham Ver Bot or Ham Bot Ver. Considering that Carlos Sainz is the flavor of the month right now, that he will be equally as good at Suzuka, that we might see him going on to battle Max Verstappen for the win, or at least get a very solid podium finish behind Charles Leclerc. Well, I don't really want to say that just yet, because Carlos's track record at Suzuka isn't all that great. His best finish as of now was a fifth place finish for McLaren in 2019. Other than that, he's either failed to finish or been in the bottom half of the point scorers, which means that I think in comparison to Charles, this is more of a bogey track for Carlos. But hey, I could be completely wrong. But based on his previous, I reckon that Carlos will have a disadvantage toward Charles Leclerc, especially since last year they brought a floor upgrade which was more relevant to Charles. I believe it will be the Monogas driver who will be more competitive when it comes to whoever's driving in Scarlet. Because Charles Leclerc's track record at Suzuka is much better. And granted, he's not really had much of an opportunity to drive here, but he's had a third and a fourth and Carlos has not been on the podium here just yet. So odds are and stats are saying that yeah, Charles is better here. And hey, this might mean we might get something competitive where Charles Leclerc only finishes just that little bit behind Max Verstappen and means that the gap between him and Max in terms of the title battle will barely get into double figures. And then we'll have some hope that, hey, there might be some challenge here after all because we're three races in and Charles Leclerc's own only, only four points behind Max. So, hey, title chances are still in it. And another thing that could or should be stronger is the integrity of the Williams chassis, since for Suzuka, James Valls is confident that they will have two cars ready for the weekend, but still no spare. I could not believe the amount of vitriol sent James Valls' way. People, pundits, left, right and centre, were calling for James Valls to resign, that he was terrible. He was the worst team principal in Williams history, that it was an utter embarrassment embarrassment that he should not be wearing that uniform. Only a couple of months ago, people were saying that he was the best team principal that Williams has ever had. Probably one of the most shocked people out there about Williams's performance is James Valls himself, as well as his technical director Pat Fry, because they've been unearthing so many things as of late, which has completely and utterly flabbergasted them. They've been left stunned with all of the stuff that Williams have had to deal with, Excel spreadsheets and cataloging car parts, and then of course they've got the really archaic machinery that they are now trying to fix and they are currently fixing. They are going through so much change at Williams, and they're doing it much quicker than it would have happened organically. Or quite frankly, it would have not happened at all. So all of this is a necessary evil for Williams to undergo, and I am really, really happy that James Valls is the one overseeing it. Braun only had one upgrade, and that was a front wing. And that was it. And there were only three chassis for the entire season. So Williams really need to go through this in order to get better. They will ideally have one coming soon, but right now they have done it properly. They have brought back the chassis very quick. They fixed it in a much more serene manner instead of doing a bodge job and potentially injuring Alex. And now they've got two chassis again. Let's just hope that one of them doesn't break it. Otherwise, we will be in the same position again, as well as Val's getting so much more criticism. But in terms of Williams' competitiveness, they might have a fair shout here, considering that, yes, Williams are no longer straight-line speed demons, but they do seem to be a little bit more competitive in the corners, so we might have a better chance of them scoring points, but that could be said for pretty much any team. But I feel like Albon will have a much better time of it than they did last year, where in that last corner, where we saw Sergeant crash, even Albon was having trouble. So it'll be very telling to see what happens when they come out of the Casio chicane and see what happens when they go down the start finish straight. If they have a much better time of it, then we might see something good from Williams, diverting attention away from all of that stuff that happened in Melbourne. Now, of course, we've got to talk about Yuki Tsunoda since this is Suzuka and Racing Bulls will have the first all Japanese lineup in an F1 session since Super Aguri's Takuma Sato and Sakon Yamamoto. And before that, of course, Takuma Sato and Yuji Ide. Now, don't worry, Ayumu Uwasa is far better than the likes of Yuji Ide because he's currently taking part in Super Formula, which Liam Lawson took part in last year and found to be really, really useful when he stubbed in for Daniel Ricciardo last year, considering how similar the Super Formula car and the Formula One car were at that time, which meant that he hit the ground running. Red Bull are looking more and more towards Super Formula as a really relevant tool in their arsenal in getting their junior drivers ready for Formula One something that Pierre Gasly demonstrated not all that long ago when he was in Super Formula or Formula Nippon, and therefore he was really good and he was really competitive when he came into Formula 1 himself. But now they've rediscovered it again. And I really don't think that this is really something that we should really read into, Iwasa replacing Ricardo for an FP1 session, because think about it. It's a Japanese driver 
racing at a Japanese track in front of the Japanese crowd with also a Japanese teammate. Having an all Japanese lineup for just at least one session, that's a huge PR move and something that makes perfect sense. And also there was a really, really interesting headline that I really wanted to share with you that Tsunoda has discovered what is his biggest stress and the biggest challenge that he has discovered in his fourth season of Formula One. No, nope, it's got nothing to do with the rigors of driving a Formula One car, the G-forces or anything like that. No, it's when to keep his mouth shut. He is trying to resist pressing the radio button and then ranting and raving down to the pit garage about something that happened. And instead, he is trying to internalize it. And that is part of his development. And he's realizing that basically spouting off on the radio is incredibly hard not to do. And it does bring people down. And it's been his biggest challenge. And if he can overcome it, this is something that means that he can then increase in his personal development. But I will admit that Yuki admitting this is a very big step towards him conquering these issues. And you get the feeling that this year is going to be a year of discovery for Yuki. Re-establishing himself as the team leader in the wake of Pierre Gasly leaving, he was basically leading the team last year, and now he's going to try and do that again. Especially since Daniel Ricciardo is struggling, and Yuki was the one that scored points first. And if it hadn't been for that last minute driver swap in Bahrain, Yuki would be three for nothing in terms of race results. And that considering that everyone was going to be writing him off in comparison to the Australian at the beginning of the season, that is something that he really should be clinging on to. If he can conquer this issue that he has with anger management, that could be a really big turning point in him surviving, maybe at the very least with racing bulls, or maybe, maybe making his case for the second Red Bull seat alongside Max Verstappen, or putting himself out there for any other team that might want him. But then some interesting news broke while I was writing the script for this video, where the previous technical director for performance, David Sanchez, who used to work for McLaren, then went to Ferrari and then went back to McLaren again, is now no longer working for McLaren after only three months, according to a misalignment with expectations for the job, as is said by Andrea Stella, which is really, really interesting to hear. And now that we've heard that Rob Marshall, the Red Bull acquisition, has been promoted to the chief designer. Maybe they don't need Sanchez in terms of performance since, well, I mean, the performance is good enough as it is. So maybe it's just completely and utterly irrelevant. And that is really interesting. Either McLaren have pulled a blinder and they just don't need Sanchez anymore, or Maybe Sanchez was just not compatible and that he might have not actually been that good. We don't know yet, but this move was really, really surprising. And I'll talk more about this in a McLaren themed video, maybe later in the week. But right now we need to talk about the predictions. Max Verstappen winning the Japanese Grand Prix. Come on, I think it's quite obvious. He's going to be driving angrily. He's going to be wanting to prove a point that just because he had a DNF last time out doesn't mean that he is going to be washed and not going to win the title because it was through no fault of his own. It was through a Brembo brakes fault, which they then pegged on Red Bull and Red Bull then pegged on Brembo. It's all a bit of bickering, but either way, Max Verstappen is going to come back from this. They'll fix the solution. They'll want to prove a point. And therefore, Max winning again and probably by about 20 seconds to Charles Leclerc, who I think will be second, because again, as I said earlier, I think we'll see a lot of the Lec results in 2024 will be the case that Ferrari will be the second fastest car again and that Charles Leclerc will be the better Ferrari since Carlos Sainz's track record here isn't all that good. And in regards to who's going to be propping up the podium, well, it's got to be Checo. Considering that his mindset is really, really solid, he'll probably want to have a much better result than he had last year where he was just colliding with everybody, especially Magnussen. And I think, quite frankly, if he can just score some points and not get into trouble, it'll be a far better time of it in Suzuka than it was in 2023. Getting a third place at Suzuka will do some good after the uh, questionable time he had at Melbourne. It would be wrong to not put a McLaren in the top five, considering how good they were last year, where they got a double podium. And I think it'll be Norris who does the job in P4. Sure. Oscar Piastri has been improving a lot, and in regards to his race management, Stella said that Piastri has improved markedly since last year, but I still think that Norris has the edge in that regard, and considering that this is a really big tyre muncher of a circuit, Norris will be better here, and he will be in fourth place. And as I mentioned earlier on in the video, I reckon that a Mercedes will be in the top five just, and it'll be Lewis Hamilton that does it. If the cooler conditions are to the W15's liking, and Lewis Hamilton was really on it in cooler conditions as they were in FP3, it might mean that this car is pretty solid this weekend, and we might see some better results where they can break away from Aston Martin and try and get back to McLaren in some way, and also make Lewis Hamilton happy, considering that he was quite responsible in designing this car. And therefore we can see the full potential, as the W15 improves, they could fix the cooling issue, all of that fundamental stuff, and then we might see more competitive results from the top five teams, which can only be good for us 
the audience. So what was that going on about with all of the stuff that Mercedes will never learn, that they seem to be just a bunch of misery guts, even though they said they promised that they wouldn't be? Well, I talk about more of that in this video here, where I'm just getting weary of Toto making all of these remarks that are starting to lose their meaning. I, just go and watch this. He's just, he's just annoying me right now, Toto.